if it was just headboarding or if there is a genetic factor there, I can tell you with certainty that these people were bizarre. Stargate Voyager. So in many places around the world, but especially in Peru and even Bolivia, we not only have these oral traditions and written accounts of ancient giants, but we have these enigmatic, elongated skull specimens that we can literally see and touch. And I want to talk about some of these with you, starting with the infamous uh, Paracas skulls. I got to see these in person a few years ago uh, with Brian Forster, and I was just simply amazed. So my question, Timothy, why is mainstream science largely ignored the enigma of these human-like entities and why is their anatomy so different than our own? This is a really enigmatic topic because the Paracas people are mysterious. They seem to have disappeared from the landscape. Now, I have friends in Peru, our, our archaeologists, who believe that the Paracas people became the Nazca people. They simply... Um, they simply evolved into the Nazca culture. And that's, I think, the prevailing theory in Peru. But um, I personally don't believe, and, I, and there's other archeologists who don't, who don't believe that that's the case. They believe that they just disappeared and they don't have an answer for where they went. Um, but the Paracas people, man, that's, that is a paradox. N forget about the elongated skull, just the culture is paradoxical, way pre-Inca, um, who inhabited the the Pacific coast of Peru, uh, specifically in what is today the Paracas region. And um, we're not really sure what the, the people were actually called. We call them the Paracas people because they ha inhabited the area that is today called Paracas. And Paracas, by the way, the word Paracas actually refers to, for lack of a better description, a sandstorm. But it's not necessarily sand. Paracas is very dry, one of the driest places on earth, as you know. It's, it's like a wasteland. It's a very strange um, environment. Because it's so dry and there's soot, like not just sand, it's not just sand, it's like dirt, that that region of Peru gets these really strong winds that whip through. I think it has something to do with the El Nino current. And it picks up all this dirt and dry dust and sand, and, it's, and, it, and it just ladens the atmosphere with it. I don't know. If, did, did you see a – they call it a paracas. If you get caught in a paracas, you're driving. You get caught in a paracas. This is a native term for this, for, this, uh, for this dirt storm. And you're driving your truck. You can't see five feet in front of your – out your windshield. It's that crazy. So um, that's where the term paracas comes from. So we say the Paracas people because it's the remains of this indigenous people in this region that the natives refer to as Paracas, hence the Paracas people. We don't really know what they're called, but we do know that they were very, as I said before, enigmatic. More enigmatic than most people think who even know something about the Paracas people because I was in Peru recently researching the Paracas people, not just the skulls, which I did, but also just this culture fascinating culture. Their textiles are famous. Uh, they were very good with textile makers. Um, they, they were able to incorporate really bright colors and do amazing things with textile. They were great builders, but they built with adobe bricks. Uh, the Paracas people, very enigmatic, very, very bizarre. First of all, most of these natives are small. They're almost like some of them were like dwarfs. I mean, they were small people. You see the Paracas skulls, online and you get the impression that they're these huge skulls but as you know they're not in fact some of them are really small but they're misshapen their 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 craniums are bizarre they're deformed some of the skulls are quite large and in terms of weight even the ones that are just comparable to our skulls are heavier they're denser so there's some anatomical differences intriguing anatomical differences the eye sockets are bigger in most cases significantly bigger uh, the cranial capacity is larger, the volume the, of the brain, um, the, the chamber where the brain sits inside of your cranium is, has more volume, generally speaking, with these, 
with the elongated skulls. Not all of the Paracas skulls are elongated. I think it was the nobles who had the elongated skulls. Uh, even the Inca, even there's Inca skulls that are elongated. So it's not just exclusive, exclusive to Paracas. You can find them up in the Tiwanaku area. You can find them actually, I find them in jungle, which is actually kind of amazing that most people don't realize and isn't publicized. They're in the jungle. Um, so it's not unique to the Paracas people, the elongation of the skulls, <clears throat> but it is the most eccentric and accentuated with the Paracas people. The most bizarre elongated skulls on earth, I think, are in Paracas. So these people were really into it and they were perfecting this elongation of the skulls. Now, the big argument, uh, the big discussion right now is, are the elongated skulls exclusively the result of cranial head deformation, cranial headboarding, a cranial deformation or, or, or a cradle headboarding. In other words, um, the manipulation of the skull uh, in infants, wrapping boards, you know, wrapping ropes and boards and so forth, which is still being done today all over the earth. That's just a fact. Or are the Paracas skulls or some of the skulls the result of a genotypic difference, a phenotypic difference that is resulting from a, a genotypic variation. In other words, are these genetic variations that we're seeing? Is it genetic? So, uh, or combination of the both, of, of the two. That's the big debate right now. Of course, mainstream archaeologists totally disregard the genetic theory. And they just say, this is all cranial headboarding. You people are crazy if you think this has anything to do with genetics. But then you have alternative historians like Brian Forster. I would be in that camp where I believe that there's something genetic going on here. It's not just cranial headboarding. You can elongate a skull, but you can't increase the size of the eye sockets with ropes and boards um, and other things. Lots of other things, little details. Uh, by the way, the increase that the because they're very, very clearly their eye sockets are larger. I'm sure you notice that on, on a lot of the skulls, not all of them, but a lot of those skulls, the eye sockets are like huge, especially like on the, um, the chongos. Yeah, the chongos. That's skull. the that's the name, the chongos pyramid. That's the that, that's the pyramid, the chongos pyramid. And then there's the chongos skull, which is in Ica, the Ica Museum, which is the, the one that's most, you know, most bizarre. Yeah, you look at the Chongo skull, I mean, and it's clear, you know, again, like you said, people make the argument that this was cradle headboarding, but obviously cradle headboarding changes the shape of a skull, but there's no way it can add more mass, right? So you volume. look at the volume, yeah, you look at the Chongo skull and then there's the, I think it's called the Waikiki skeleton mm -hmm. skull that I saw and that's mm -hmm. that's got the one with huge eye sockets mm -hmm. and then along in concert with that one's Paracas. up towards Cusco. Right. That's near Cusco in a museum. And but even the Chongo skull has abnormally large eye sockets. Yeah. And along with all those, then you have kind of these, what I, I guess I would call these infant elongated skull mummies that have been unearthed recently, it seems like. Yes. And it looks like these were born yes. right out of the womb with huge elongated skulls. So I guess my final question, Timothy, that's right, yeah. could these humanoid looking um, specimens go back to uh, being related somehow to the golden age fraternity um, we were discussing earlier. Were, they, were these several generations removed possibly? Or do you think they're separate altogether? It's possible. Um, my colleague and good friend of mine, Eli Marsuli, uh, has also done extensive research on the elongated skulls and has actually done a lot of DNA work. And I think he did really top, and he did it in conjunction with, uh, Chase Kletsky and with Brian Forster, he had a whole team. He had some, uh, uh, an archaeologist and he had a whole team and they just did a really, really good job, really professional job at going in there and, um, and, and extracting uh, DNA samples in a very highly scientific controlled way. And it was just unimpeachable. Their work was unimpeachable. Phenomenal job. And they were able to find some very surprising, they were able to get some very surprising results from their DNA testing. And I'll refer you to, uh, to L.A. Marsulli's work on that. I know Brian Forster has also done independently some of his own DNA testing. And we have also done DNA testing. I've done it. 
um, in Peru on a, on a, on a one particular skull. What I think the DNA testing is pointing to is indicating is first of all, I, neither I or nor L.A. Marsuli have ever been able to extract nuclear DNA. And, and you know, from, remember back to biology class, um, mitochondrial DNA is the mom's DNA. And that one is much easier to find. Nuclear DNA, that's how you find out who the father was. So um, we've been able to get in every case mitochondrial DNA but never nuclear DNA. Now, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if Brian's been able to get it. I've heard, I think I've heard a rumor that he did was, I don't know if you know, but I think Brian maybe was able to get nuclear DNA, but I know that I was not. And LA Marshall was not either. Um, but the DNA that LA was able to get, and he did like 50 some samples from different skulls, um, had some very interesting haplogroups showing up. And it was there was an indication, I would say a strong indication, uh, that uh, genetically speaking, the Paracas people were not indigenous to Peru. They were very distinct people. Apparently, they came from the Middle East, Europe, or the Black Sea region, in general, generally speaking, what the data was indicating, which I find highly intriguing. Now, my colleague Eli Marsuli believes that these elongated skulls of Paracas people are somehow related to the Nephilim that the Bible talks about, to the giants that the Bible talks about, and, and the hybrid offspring of the Watchers in general. Um, and I think that's a plausible theory. Uh, some people believe that the, this may be a Ice Age race, humanoid race, or maybe a variation of the human species, uh, very, very ancient, in that the Paracas people were sort of the last of that race. I find that theory to be highly intriguing. I really do. I, I find that to be highly intriguing. Um, but I've never seen any myself. I've never personally seen any DNA results that indicate non-human DNA. Maybe in the my, in the uh, nuclear and then in the, in the uh, nuclear DNA, maybe some of that would would maybe there would be an unknown factor there in terms of the uh, in terms of the the genome. Uh, some some unknown genes that that are that are not human. I don't know, um, but I do know that there's definitely some indication that these people were not indigenous to Peru and are unlike the other native tribes around them. Some of them, some of them, because remember there would have been intermingling with the tribes around them. So you're going to get you're going to get sort of a mudblood of different uh, of different um, uh, haplogroups mixed together there with the Paracas people. But certainly some of them appear to be not from Peru, uh, but from the Middle East, the Black Sea, or somewhere in Europe. And there's some other intriguing things, too, about the Paracas people that I'm actually developing a TV show in my second episode, third episode. I'm in Peru, actually, with Eli Marsuli uh, and, um, and, we're, and Chase Kletsky, and we are exploring, further exploring this mystery of the Paracas people. And we make some very intriguing discoveries that I think most people are not aware of concerning the Paracas people, concerning the Chongos Pyramid. But, uh, I'm not going to give it away yet, but we make some very intriguing uh, discoveries with ground penetrating radar drone, our ground state of the art ground pen penetrating radar drone, uh, and also um, some very intriguing discoveries related to the customs of the Paracas people. These are not normal human beings. Let's just, that's for sure. Whoever they are, whatever they were doing in terms of the cranial situation, if it was just headboarding or if there is a genetic factor there, I can tell you with certainty that these people were bizarre. They were not normal people by any stretch of the imagination. This was a very unique group of people, their customs, the way they looked, the way they dressed, the way they lived totally different than anything I've ever encountered. So um, that's ongoing research that, uh, uh, that I'm doing. Oh, by the way, as a little aside, I was sent a picture by an archaeologist friend of mine recently in which a colleague of hers was up north in Peru or maybe central Peru on the coast. She discovered in unearthed an elongated skull that is absolutely enormous. 
And I'm going to be going and doing some research on this and, and taking a look. But from what I've seen, the pictures they sent me, and these are archaeologists in Peru. These aren't just lay people. These are archaeologists in Peru working in the field discovered a skull that I don't know exactly because I haven't laid hands on it or taken official measurements. But just from the pictures that I've seen her holding it like this next to her head, and I'm assuming she's a small Peruvian, you know, maybe 5'5", five, five, this thing had, I mean, you're talking an 8 to 12 foot person. Incredible. So, Will this possibly be featured in your upcoming new TV show? Very possibly. Awesome. So I've got to track down. I've, I've got to go and do some more investigating, but it's very possible it will make it into, if not this episode, uh, this elongated skull episode, a future one. But uh, it's the largest elongated skull I've ever seen in my life. And it is truly gigantic. You know, it's not like 20 foot tall giant, but it's definitely a really big person. Like we're talking, you know, from from quick and dirty estimates from 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 some of the people I emailed. Uh, you're talking, like I said, at least like an eight foot tall person with Incredible. a big elongated skull. So that's, you know, it could be a one off, could be fake. I don't know. You never know what you're dealing with in these countries, you know, these third world countries. But but the guy who sent me the image, a good friend of mine, highly reputable guy in the archaeological community in Peru. And when can viewers maybe um, expect to see this first episode of your new show coming up? Well, we haven't parked the new show anywhere yet, so we don't know where, what network we're going to be on. We're in, we're in conversations right now, but it's going to pop up somewhere soon. Uh, I don't know where yet. I don't know where yet. Um, I have a website, timothyalbrino.com. I have not updated it in a long time. I got to go in and update it, and I'm going to do that shortly, where I will, I will be announcing uh, where and when people can see this new TV show. TV series. I also have a mailing list. So people are interested in tracking with me. People can track with me on there if they go to my website, timothyalbrino.com at the bottom. And I'm going to move things around here shortly. I'm going to revamp that website. But right now you can find the mailing list to sign up on the mailing list, the very bottom of the page by the contact. I, I, I used to do stuff. People always reference the stuff I used to do on online, on YouTube, like the Elbrino analysis or the uh, the true legend series. That was a long, that's like ancient history to me right now with the stuff I'm doing. I would say that the stuff I'm doing now is much more exciting. Even, even though I would say that was also very exciting. It's like I've up the, I've up the ante. Things are even more exciting now. Uh, I just haven't been making videos about them. So I'm going to be getting back into the game a little bit more in terms of um, speaking to the public, making videos, interacting with the audience. So so to everybody watching or listening, go to uh, timothyalbarino.com and you can find links to his new book, Birthright, as well as, uh, like he said, the newsletter, email, uh, subscription list. Subscribe to that to keep, stay up to date with him. And uh, Timothy, man, thanks so much for your time today. This has been a fascinating interview and I'm really looking forward to this show in the near future. Yeah. Well, again, I appreciate you having me on and... Uh... Uh, by the way, people can also, my book's on Amazon. You can go right to amazon.com. Just type in birthright in my name and you'll see it. But yeah, this was a, this was really fun. And, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to come back. And we, we, there's so many more topics that uh, we could dive into. So yeah, I love I think, talking about this stuff. I think we, we only got to about half my topics, but this will definitely just uh, keep you unhooked for another interview. So thanks again, man. Thank you.